All right, and we're live. Welcome to the Philosophy Podcast number six. We have a very, very, very special guest today, Isaac, the realized man, aka the realized chicken. Introduce yourself and let's get started. It's going to be fun, guys. Sit down, relax, get comfortable. Thanks for that introduction. I'm glad to be here on the sixth installment on the Philosophy Podcast. Did I fuck that up? I did, didn't I? Yeah, just oh, we'll give it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my name is Isaac. Uh, I've got a channel called The Realized Man. It's basically about self-actualization, personal development, self-improvement, giving you guys all the tools to battle that reptilian brain and become successful in the modern world. So uh, I talk about similar stuff to uh, Philip, Stoicism, and all that good shit philosophy. So yeah, I'm glad to be on the show. Yeah, yeah. Um, Isaac's got an awesome channel. He uh, he basically kind of records what he's learning as he's going along the journey of self improvement, and that's something our friend Suhud pointed out, which is really cool. And I really like that about his channel because a lot of people, um, if you guys know who Gary V is, pause the video, look him up. But he was saying that too many people, especially young people, are just trying to add value and teach people stuff. When in reality, people at our age should also be documenting their journey because that's what people like to, to see. That's why people like vlogs. They like to relate to other people. And I think that's what um, Isaac is doing really well on this channel. And that's something I'm trying to incorporate as well with a vlog coming out tomorrow. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to talk about YouTube, the hustle, the grind. I'll talk a bit about my book, what's in it, what's kind of allowed me to push through uh, resistance. And um, yeah, first of all, where do you encounter resistance in your day, Isaac? Like, what's an example of where you encounter resistance? Is it in the morning when you wake up or when is it? And how do you right, deal soon, with it? As soon as I wake up, as soon as I wake up and I just think about all this shit I have to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to get my reading in somehow. I have to meditate at some point. I have to study for university at some stage. I have to film a video for the YouTube channel, video a day at some stage. I need to check up on my subscribers, check up on the comments. There's resistance everywhere to do it. Because we all know the natural state is to take the path of least resistance, right? You, you don't want to do any of this shit. You want to lie down in bed. You want to sleep. You want to... You know, maybe have a fab and take it easy, but you're going to have to push through that resistance somehow. So that's how I encounter my resistance throughout the day in those areas. Yeah, for me, it's like um, never been a morning person, but when I do get up, it's fine. But it's that the first like two minutes when I'm waking up and I'm like, no, <laughs> no, you're just in your little, <laughs> you're just in your little cocoon in your bed and you're like, ah, ah. Because honestly, yeah. your, your, your brain does not give a fuck whether you're successful. Your brain doesn't give a shit about your dreams. Uh, mm -hmm. You want to, or you want to write a book, or you want to get 20,000 subscribers on YouTube. Your brain doesn't give, give a fuck. It just wants to pump out some kids, and that's it. Yep. It just calories into babies. That's something um, Mario <laughs> Tomic said. Calories into babies, that's the purpose of life. <laughs> um, so it can be very hard to overcome that in the morning. Um, one thing I've really found to make a difference is negative visualization. Mm. And I might, um, I might watch like a trailer to a movie like Blood Diamond, if you guys have seen that. Yeah, pretty, I have. Yeah, pretty, so just like thinking about those thoughts and thinking about how fortunate we are to have the opportunity to pursue, my, pursue our dreams, staying in that bed for a few minutes after that just feels like, like it's shameful, you know, and I, I like to, uh, to, to negatively visualize and be practically pessimistic in the morning in order to just stopping a little bitch, get out of bed and do what I have to do for the day. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good strategy as well. I've, I think people need to find what works for them. Some people use um, the negative uh, consequences of not doing what they have to do as a motivator. Mm. So, for example, perhaps you have to study for your exam so you can envision yourself failing, your parents grilling into you, you losing thousands of dollars, fucking living on the streets. You can just imagine the worst case scenario. But some people are motivated by imagining the uh, potential success. So you can imagine what could go right. You know, perhaps you passing or perhaps you succeeding. Perhaps you gaining your 100,000 subscribers and chilling out on the beach and making videos for the rest of your life. So you really need to find out what works for you. I think for me, personally, a bigger motivator is the negative. The fear of failing. The fear of mediocrity. That's what really gets me going. So... 
I guess it's kind of negative visualization as well, but not so much in the extent of um, thinking of how fortunate I am to be in the position I am. It's more of a uh, thinking of, oh shit, I'm going to be like the people Philip is thinking of if I don't succeed. <laughs> yeah, definitely agree. And, and, and like you said, it's, it's different for different people. And <clears throat> there is nothing you can say that's going to apply to everyone. And that's the same with every aspect of life. You can't be like, oh, this diet is going to be the best for you. We're all different. <clears throat> so it's good to understand and hear what other people do so you can make up your mind and try them out. But I really do like to, to consider and contemplate how great, what a grateful position I'm in in the morning just to get the day started. Oh, what your thoughts of thoughts are about affirmations? That's something that's pretty big in like you know self help and personal development books. People always talk about affirmations about waking up in the morning with like certain affirmations. Do you think they work or do you think that's bullshit? I think affirmations are good, but it depends on what you're trying to affirm. So I think that you know this goes back to the cliche of having a a purpose, right? Having a purpose, something that's driving you. And I think the the idea that you can judge a man by the size of his problems is a really good way to approach whether affirmations work or not. So I think that if your purpose is grounded and it affects other people's well-being, then it's going to be very difficult not to get up in the morning because whether you work hard or not is going to affect other people. So if you have clients, if you have a YouTube channel even, or if you have like a duty to fulfill in society and value to add, um, your problems are huge. They affect other people and you're going to be much less likely to not get out of bed. I mean, if you have a student and um, uh, their problem is only not doing an essay for themselves for their own uh, arbitrary number out of 100, then it's going to be much, much, much easier not to get out of bed because they're whether they fail or, or succeed has no influence on other people. But if you, if a CEO doesn't wake up in the morning, doesn't feel like getting <laughs> out of bed, the whole the whole fucking company is going to crash. Yeah, and, uh, people aren't going to be able to feed their families, and he's going to be in a pretty fucked up situation. I mean, he can do it, but he might even get arrested. <laughs> well, I don't yeah, know. pretty much. Yeah, like yeah, that's, that's, someone's probably going to fucking kill him or something. <laughs> um, that's, yeah. yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, I think that's an interesting byproduct of this whole YouTube thing. Growing um, the YouTube channel has increased my responsibility. For example, previously I didn't expect to be to hold so much responsibility in terms of um, other people's lives. But as your subscriber base grows, as the views grow, like I think both of you have both you and me have similar metrics, like two hundred thousand views and stuff like that. You actually impact people's lives, and people actually reach out to you and ask for advice, and you kind of feel like a duty to give them the best advice, to put the best information out there, because now you're almost like a, you know, like a role model to other people. Yeah, I think and it, when, when it begins, when you start on YouTube, and maybe not for all people, but for me even, I was just like, so how can I make the most money? I want to get the fuck, <laughs> like, I'm just like, I'm on eHow, this is back like a year ago, I'm like, how do you make a million dollars from YouTube? And like, yeah, that's cool, you can make money from YouTube, but the more you kind of progress... <laughs> the more you start to realize that you can actually make a change to people's lives and it's not just about the money right it's about yeah. adding value it's about um influencing the world and it becomes less about that and i think today everybody should start a youtube channel every mm. single person because everyone has opinions everyone has things they want to talk about but in today's age we've gone too far into this electronic centric lifestyle and no one has people to to express themselves to the, to the fullest amount yeah. and therefore a medium like YouTube is almost I think a requirement for someone to not feel isolated and lonely and stuff because today it's ridiculous and there's no going back from this very um, socially isolated world and, and we need a medium like YouTube to be able to express our ideas and connect with each other I mean unless we go back to caveman times and you, you go to some fucking I don't know no internet tribe I think you've got no other option but to, to, to interact with the, the world around you. So, Isaac, what do you think about YouTube channels? Do you think everybody should start them? Do you think everybody should be an entrepreneur heading into the future today? What's your opinion on that? Um, I don't think it's sustainable for everybody to be an entrepreneur. I don't think it's even possible because generally to be an entrepreneur, you need a certain type of mindset, a certain type of work ethic, and that's hard to come by. So... I think that everybody should try and find a job or something that they love doing, something that's actually valuable to them, but not necessarily be an entrepreneur. I think entrepreneurs 
should be entrepreneurs, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yeah, I definitely see what you mean. I think certain personality types are... Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of personality personality types that would make good op- entrepreneurs 50 years ago wouldn't today. Um, when I was talking with Mario Tomic, we were both saying that um, uh, people who have been gamers for a lot of years make good entrepreneurs because they have the capacity to sit on a computer, which is where entrepreneurs are made today, for hours yes. and hours and hours on end to do really tedious, boring tasks. Yes. <laughs> so I, that's I agree with that. So that was something I was quite optimistic about when I heard because I used to play a lot of video games. <laughs> Me, me too, dude. Me yeah. too, dude. Like, like ridiculous um, amounts. Like if I if I like tell a normal person how many hours a day I was on, like fucking RuneScape. Jam and RuneScape, they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> you kidding me? <laughs> no, no, I yeah. totally understand that analogy because I used to play. I actually made a video uh, about this the other day. I used to that, yeah. play a lot of role playing games, like Elder Scrolls Oblivion, you know, Dragon Age, you name. It. I used to play, put hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours into it, with the primary goal of just becoming the best. So I'll spend hours a day researching the oblivion wiki trying to find out little bits of information that are gonna help me get the better upper edge or over my um opponents and stuff and you could definitely translate that into entrepreneurship except instead of like trying to figure out how to get the party hat it's trying to figure out how to perhaps optimize your seo or how to make your um, marketing funnel really good <laughs> you know, it's, it just translates to something else but the same mindset the same obsessiveness still applies so yeah, Absolutely. that analogy is a yeah. good one. Yeah, I think I think it's also that perhaps it's that competitive spirit that really makes a good entrepreneur. Because, <clears throat> I mean, like we're all friends. We have a huge network of of friends that we're doing YouTube with. But at the end of the day, we're all competitive. But if you can kind of use your ego to be con- competitive, but kind of be disattached from it, then it can be a good thing. Yeah, yeah, I agree, definitely. We're always checking in each other's numbers. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's just I think you're actually one. more ahead of me right now. <laughs> to, to deny that is like, is just saying that, like, come on, right? Everyone's competitive. We're, we're all in this to, to, to win, I guess you could say. Yeah. But as long as deep down you understand that the victory is over yourself, then you're, you're in the right position. I think um, it's a good thing too, to be honest with you. I think that competitiveness is actually a good thing because even if you lose, let's say, between our circle of um, guys that do this personal development stuff, Sahad, um, CMU, me, everyone else, right? Even if you lose, lose. chances are you're still going to get like 100k subs. You're still going to have a really good channel. You're still going to have a huge following because you're driven to compete with other people. Or if I see you step up your video quality, if I see Sim step up his video quality, I'm going to be precious to my video quality. So at the end of the day, no one loses if we're all being competitive with each other. What's the point of aiming so high when I'm never going to actually attain anything? And that's, I think, <laughs> um, the misconception people have about what pleasure truly is. When you attain something, you're satisfied with it. It's like, um, let's say you're sitting on this laptop. So I'm sitting on this laptop right now. I'm, I'm doing this podcast. My hypothalamus, a region of my brain, starts blinking. And it's Ooh. like, I, I want something salty. I feel like something salty. And it will keep blinking. It will be like, salty, salty, salty. I'll get so distracted that I start to envision myself being satisfied by that salty craving. And then I'll, kind of like a chain reaction from A to B, I'll stand up, which I won't in this podcast, but I'll stand up. I'll go to the microwave. I'll, I'll cook something salty and then I'll eat it. And then I'll be satisfied after I eat it. But that satisfaction isn't the pleasure. The pleasure was sitting here envisioning um, that saltiness coming into my mouth and mm. into my body, making um, the steps, uh, going about it. And I think people are just chasing uh, the satisfaction as the pleasure today more and more and more and more. And we have easier means to do it. The example being walking to McDonald's, swiping your credit card and getting something salty. But the, the journey towards that satisfaction is so short. So you mm. don't actually get any pleasure from it, but you get satisfaction. So little pleasure, lots of satisfaction over and over and over again turns into obesity. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. Like yeah. it, it all boils back to the point of um how we still have the brains or the biology of a caveman, but we're in a world that doesn't really um help us in that regard. That's why you have all these people doing no fat these days, because because of pornography on the internet, a average guy will see more ass than the most alpha caveman 
of that that ruled like seven clans a thousand years ago. <laughs> so that does something to your brain if you're constantly getting pleasure, pleasure, pleasure without really doing anything, without chasing it. So yeah, I think uh, that change needs to be addressed, and that's what I'm trying to do on my channel too, to show people that this is your brain, this is how it works, and this is the world we're living in, and there's a disconnect there. So you need to bridge the gap if you truly want to be successful. You need to understand yourself. I think that's what you're trying to do with your channel as well, exactly. You need to extend the pleasure. Yeah. Extend the pleasure ex ex by fasting, by no fap, by yes. uh, walking to the supermarket, cooking your own food, expanding that act, the, the real pleasure instead of being deluded into thinking the pleasure is in the satisfaction itself. This is something I'm really covering in my book that I'm writing that I'm always talking about, but I never actually go into depth on, especially on, in one chapter on the topic of um, uh, sexual nature, no fat, for example. And I think that there's some kind of narrative today because we've, we've become so sexually liberated that to oppose anything of that is like kind of stupid. Like, wh why would you stop... Why even talk about that? Why does that even matter? <laughs> but in the brain, there's no d distinction between that and obesity and other drugs. Of course, there is on some level, but it's all dopamogenic. It's mm. the same. It's the same reward system. So how is it any different? Speaking badly about about sexuality and stuff is it's like verboten. It's it's taboo and it, it's like not allowed because we were so recently liberated into it. So it's it's too soon to to go back against it, but yeah. But the the rise of the internet has been so exponential, the problem has come too quickly for us to to see it and combat it, and and that's why this movement is growing um, so quickly. But again, it's it's really eccentric and it, and it's strange. So I think that what all of us are doing is really good and voicing this and having people understand that just because it's um taboo or whatever doesn't mean it's any different and any less dangerous to, to obesity or drugs obviously to a to lesser extent but yeah so i think that's a really good thing and i think it's not for everybody in a very extreme sense but i think it's something everybody should try to see whether it's affected them negatively yeah yeah, yeah. definitely different people have different reactions to this stuff as well and um i want to ask you a question do you think uh the problem is no fap per se or no porn like or is it pornography or is it the fapping that really messes up the dopamine levels in people since we're talking about that i think it's <clears> both <throat> um pornography to a, to a bigger extent i think that's yes. that's like I the agree. most unnatural thing and that was something i personally found pretty easy to get rid of so that wasn't mm. really a problem for me um i i, I don't like how no fact to a lot of people is like you have to completely abstain like a hundred percent yeah <laughs> like like come no, on man <laughs> no it, it doesn't it doesn't work like that like uh, then you're just going to go through ups and downs and it's it's like if yeah. we're comparing philosophy to it cynicism which is complete restriction of all pleasure is compar comparable to the very um like the harsh advocates of no fat no pmo I've gone 300 days, like, cool, yeah. bro, you've gone 300 days, but you're still thinking about it and typing on these forums for hours a day, so how has it actually helped you? Yeah, <laughs> Maybe it's yeah. even worsened it to the point where you're just introspecting on it too much, so I think that pornography is better to answer your question. Um, that being not so much, the point is that you're unattached from it, that's it. Mm. Can, you, can you sit down and control urges? If you yes. can't, then there's an issue, but if you can... Yes. And it's self-sustainable, then good for you. <laughs> I think that's yeah. That's that answered my question pretty good. Let's yeah. go back to the topic of your book. So okay. I know you're really into um, stoicism. So what inspired you to write your book like, exactly? It was, it's obviously stoicism, but at what point in reading this philosophy or living it did you say, you know what, I'm going to write a book about this and get this message out to people? Okay. Um. So I've been writing it for just over a year now. So it's been a long time. Um, I can't say that I've always wanted to write a book. Like it was never like a dream of mine growing up. It sort of just happened. So I think it, it first happened when I was getting into entrepreneurship online. I'm like, how can I start a YouTube channel? It was more about a blog then. Firstly, I started with a blog about global warming, believe it or not. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I'll study, dude. I studied environmental science and biology. So I'm like, fuck yeah, okay. climate change. Like 
Which is cool. Get the AdSense rolling. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you. It was called JustOurPlanet.com. Um, but, but anyway, back to the point. So I was in Starbucks and I was watching a video from uh, Mario Tomic and Julian himself. So they had a collaboration uh-huh. video and Mario was talking to him about how to lose fat. It was like an hour long video. And I was listening to that and I was like, oh, okay, I could write like a small ebook or something. So I had a page going, it was just an outline, like count your calories, macronutrients. And I was just typing at that, typed away, typed away. A few weeks, it had grown a bit. And then at some point, I forgot when, I, I, I kind of, I, I knew about stoicism, I read about it, but I had come across an article where they were talking about how to make goals through stoic philosophy. And that was that. You should just attach yourself to the process and enjoy the journey. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll add in a little paragraph. So I added in a little paragraph when I was talking about goals and fat loss. And that paragraph became two, three. <laughs> a year later, it's like the basis and the framework for the entire thing. So that's kind of uh, what happened. Yeah, I also want to know, um, so what's the main difference between your book and let's say perhaps Ryan Holiday's book or some other books that are about stoicism right now? Right, so out. first I'm going to talk about how Stoicism is making a comeback. So Stoicism is making a huge comeback today. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because, like we were saying at the start of the podcast episode, uh, we're all rich. And not in terms of materialistic goods, otherwise I'd have a fucking Rolex on right now. But we're all rich in terms of um, our evolutionary selves, right? We're all, yeah. we're all satisfied. Um, and... The difference between my book and Ryan Holiday's is that mine is more about health. Okay. So it's, it's, it's like the stoic body. That's the title of the book. And it's about improving your health, obesity in the modern world, using stoicism as the ah, principle for that. Okay. So that's the difference. Yeah. So it goes into the science <clears throat> behind fat loss and all that stuff, but it's all kind of based on stoicism. The principle of the book being that you must um, not live to eat, but eat to live, not live to ah, exercise, yeah. but exercise to live. So that's kind of what it's about. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Perhaps you can give me some tips on um, getting to work on a major project like that because I've had a goal for a while now. I haven't started writing it or making it, but I wanted to make a course basically on psychological warfare in cool. regards to what we were talking about before about how we have our body and our mind that was made for a different time or that was, that's been the same for let's say 100,000 years, but because of the changes that are happening now, there's a big gap. So I want to give people the tools to uh, mitigate the damage or to lower, make that gap smaller, as in like looking at cognitive biases and the way your mind thinks so that you know how your mind operates, then you can uh, go around that and become more successful. But how did you get yourself to just start? Because I've been having this idea for a while, but I haven't started yet. Did you collect a bunch of resources or did you just start writing and change it as you go along or yeah i really i mean i should have done it in a really organized way but you know in the best scenario you plan it out and you have all the structure and and maybe i'll do that for the second one but for this first one it really didn't start like that and it it just kind of evolved as i evolved and Ah. i I i think what made it important and when it really started to snowball if that's what you're asking is when Everything I did in my day, I related back to that idea. <clears throat> so even if I'm looking at a wall, just like fucking staring at a wall and I'm chilling in my room, I'm going to relate something about something on the wall to that project. Ah, so, yeah. so that sounds quite strange. And obviously it's, it's not easy to be like, okay, everything I do from now on relates to creating this course. But I think that's it. Try to relate unrelated things to it. Start to kind of create your paradigm around that course get mm. obsessed like you said before that's yes 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 definitely definitely like for that, me that, i think it's um you're gone I, I think that's how you'll make your best product like i could have finished this book ages ago and just like published it but yeah when you put everything into it like it, it's got to it's got to be, be coming from a frame where your entire day is revolved around that so go on yeah you know definitely yeah. definitely like for me i think my problem is that um i'm trying to get it perfect straight away so when I think about making this course, I'm thinking of it being the best fucking course that anyone's ever going to view. So that puts a lot of resistance in starting. Like I actually made a video on procrastination about how if you think about the whole 
thing at once is going to discourage you from actually doing it. So that's my problem right now. But it's hard to take my own advice and you know just get started or just do a little bit or yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I filmed a video on this today, more for diets, but it was like the 80-20 rule, and I'm sure you know. What ah, that is. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so if, if, if you, principle. Yeah, so if we like relate it back to to YouTube, for example, imagine your project was YouTube. Right now, you're focusing on what camera you have, I guess, <laughs> instead of actually filming the videos, <laughs> and that's the point. Like, and I, I think that's the biggest thing with starting. It's it's hard. It really is hard to to actually start with the project, but instead of just like think about which platform you'd use for the course and, and you just start with something. Just like my example mm. with my book, what I had planned out as my draft is like completely unrelated from what it is now. So it's never going to be mm. perfect from the start, never. Otherwise, it wouldn't mm. be good in the first place. Otherwise, you haven't put thought into evolving it and changing it. Yes, yes, so it's yes, not, yes. it's not perfect doing it like that. <laughs> so you've just got to start yeah. with something, even if it's rubbish. Even if you, you see it as rubbish, it's got to be something. You've got to put something down and then work with that. Otherwise, you've got nothing to work with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the fulfillment you get out of actually doing this kind of work, like you writing your book or you making videos and stuff like that. Um, there's been times where I've had to make a video and I would be on the computer sitting down for eight hours straight just editing, doing all sorts of things, especially for those animation videos I put up. It takes a long-ass fucking time. And during that process, you sometimes get thoughts like, oh, man, is this worth it? Is it really going to work? Should I give up? But what I found interesting is every single time when I've actually finished the project, the sense of fulfillment you get or that little bit of pleasure you get is always enough for you to do it again, to get back into it, despite eight hours of shitting it and getting angry and pissy. Is that the same with you writing or... Once Um, you finish a chapter, you feel a certain amount of accomplishment and you just keep, it motivates you to keep going or is there something else that's motivating you? I'll talk about writing in a second because it's different, but I had the exact same experience with a video today. So I'm going to be honest, like with every single video I film, not most, every single one, I don't want to do it before I film it. Every single one, (laughs) I don't want to film it. I do not want to film it. I would rather sit down and do nothing. Um, And I had this experience today where I went out into public. So I was at a park, lots of people walking around, and I filmed a video there. And that's quite a strange experience for me to do instead of just doing it in my room where I'm more comfortable. Um, And I, like, walked to the spot where I was going to do the video, and I just, like, stood there, and I just walked away. (laughs) I felt, like, shy. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. And I, I walked, like, 100 meters, and I was like, Okay, I could go and play basketball now, but I'm probably not going to have fun because I let myself down. So I was like, fuck it, I'm going back. I set it up, and the moment I started filming, two seconds after that, I'm like, okay, this is fucking awesome. (laughs) And that (laughs) feeling is worth it. So with writing, I compare it to, I was listening to a podcast uh, with uh, Joe Rogan and Robert Greene. Robert Greene, we all know the author, Mastery, 48 Laws of Power. And And Joe Rogan asked him, what he likes most about writing and he said i like the 10 percent. so with writing 90 percent of writing is just like oh this sucks i'm so stressed cortisol psh, i want to give up this sucks uh, i'm a fraud i'm gonna rip it up but 10 percent <laughs> of it is like flow magic genius yeah. is coming out of you or at least i think it is <laughs> oh, might be, might be <laughs> bullshit but that 10 percent is worth it and i guess that's the comparison to videos the the 10 percent of actually filming it versus the 90 percent of thinking about how much you don't want to film yeah, yeah, definitely. And something I find very interesting is once you start getting a bit more involved into this type of stuff, it seems that you start getting ideas a lot easier or you start getting ideas from the strangest things. Whereas like when I start making the YouTube channel, I would have to perhaps sit down, maybe read a book and then get some ideas out of the book and say, okay, that's a good topic for a video. Whereas now, because my mind or my subconscious mind is um, primed towards making videos, I would literally walk outside, look at my chickens, like, oh, I can make a video about that. <laughs> I'll be driving past McDonald's, oh, I can make a video about that. Oh, oh, yeah. I can make a, I've, I've got like so many ideas now that I almost can't keep up with like the amount of videos I want to make. Yeah, I have a list of like 30 fucking ideas and like, <laughs> yeah, for real, I write them down. And I, I think it comes down to positive reinforcement. So it comes back to perfection and what you were talking about before with starting the course. So 
before starting the course, you don't have the positive reinforcement of your ideas being created and actually being worthwhile. But with the videos, the more videos you film, the more um, positive reinforcement, I guess you could call it validation from viewers, but also yourself, just seeing that people are responding to it and actually engaging with it, that gives you more confidence and instills more confidence in yourself that you're actually saying shit that makes sense. Yeah, so when I first yeah. made a video, I'm like, <clears throat> I don't even know if I'm speaking English. I need someone to tell me if I'm speaking English. <laughs> I'm yeah. just kidding there, obviously, but um, that's the point, I think. Positive reinforcement. Yeah. You know, you know I, I think your mind literally changes depending on like what type of influences you put in your mind, what type of things you do often. Because a few years back, I used to be obsessed with skateboarding, right? Me that's and my cool. friends used to skate for hours every weekend. We'll be skateboarding. So um, when you skateboard, there's certain obstacles that you can find, like stairs and ledges and rails yeah. that are really fun to skate. So when we used to drive around in the car, um, everybody will be able to find a spot. You can see at the corner of your eye, you see the stairs. and like, oh, bro, stairs over there. And we'll stop the car and skate, right? So I hung out with a friend of mine who used to skate with me. He still skates. And we were driving the other day. And um, we drove past like some stairs. And he saw the stairs like, bro, did you see those stairs? But that's, that's no longer in me. I didn't see the stairs. When I see stairs now, I just see stairs. I don't see skating obstacles. I feel like the same uh, mechanism that makes your brain look for that has now translated into YouTube or personal development or internet marketing and stuff like that. <laughs> um, okay, I've got a question for you. So where can you see yourself in five years down the road from YouTube? I know, I know it's, it's, it's not that good to think long term and it's better to focus in the present moment, whatever. But where do you see yourself going in five years? Where do you want to be? What kind of influence do you want to have? Um, in five years time, I want to have developed a range of courses that really help people change their lives as in, because personal development is something that I've become incredibly passionate about. Like uh, when I start talking about fucking audio books or some shit, y y people will think I'm on cocaine or something. So if I can somehow make a living doing that, then I'll be very happy, especially because right now I'm not even making any money out of it. I'm just making these videos if you, you can check me out on social blade freaking apparently i made 40 dollars or some shit which i haven't <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> but, but hopefully if i can make a living doing that that will be ideal and yeah fuck it and i'm not sure hopefully my brain would have changed because if i look at myself five years ago i feel like i'm a different person so i want to see how far i can take it if i'm continuously evolving 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 recreating myself as robert green says in the 48 laws of power what do yes. you see yourself yes it's strange <clears throat> kind of shifting into new paradigms as you develop as you learn more and it, it, it's kind of almost overwhelming to think about how many paradigms are out there <laughs> like there's so many available there's so much you can do there's so much you can accomplish and, and become someone com indistinguishable from who you are right now so I don't know. I don't know what the answer is in five years. Um, I just want to influence as much as possible. Influence, have my ideas out there, have them engaged with people, um, share ideas, discuss, debate, um, develop together, right? That's the whole thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Improve together definitely. as a whole. Yeah. Especially a social circle, like the group of friends you'd be hanging out with um, in five years. Ideally, you want to be hanging out with people that are constantly challenging your views, constantly showing you new things, you know what I mean? So yeah. Constantly mind-fucking you, per se. Yeah, and like, I love my friends, but I, I, I do want to have people in my life where, who are like heading in the same uh, direction, who are really hustling, like have that same mm -hmm. um, fire-in-the-belly mindset, yeah, right? Yeah, They yeah. just want to fucking go, 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 go. There's no, you just fucking go. It's not like, oh, okay work hard and play hard i mean i want to like play hard and stuff as well but i mean just like go like a fucking ship <laughs> it, it's um, hard to find people like that isn't it it really it is, is. And I think, uh, yeah it's, it's, it's a rarity <laughs> um and then I, I think for a lot of people watching as well you might be in the same mindset but you might feel like you might be lonely if you leave those friends because then you'd have no one, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why I think it's so difficult for people to change as a whole because other people around them are so influential on them, but they don't want to leave them because then they're not fucking lonely. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You Sometimes you do yeah. seem extreme um, compared to your friends. I'm not sure about you, but the way I operate is, is pretty um, extreme <laughs> in terms of YouTube and this stuff. I literally almost don't waste any time on anything else. So if you were to watch me the whole day, you'd be bored out of your mind because I'll be there reading. I'll be there 
writing something, I'll be there making a video, I'll be there studying for uni, I'll be there sleeping, that's it. Yeah, Occasionally yeah. I watch like a YouTube video about yeah. maybe lifting or something, or, but I barely watch movies, I barely do any of that stuff. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing, I'm sure balance would be better, but that's just the way my mind operates. When I have something that I'm aiming for, I go all in. Yeah, and it's, and it's strange because I'm the same, um, clearly, but there are times where I'm not actually being productive. But I'm still in that state of hustle. It's it's like a it's like a it's like a hustle is like high cortisol. <laughs> yeah. And I'm still in that state. It's like you get addicted to that to that cortisol feeling. But but and, and you have to find balance. But when you shift out of that, it can be very easy to recline into that instinctual nature of just chilling the fuck out because whoa 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 I'm just surviving. Why are you hustling and yeah. invoking so much cortisol, increasing your body? Like what's the point? So. It, I think a lot of entrepreneurs um, and people who are just hustling in general struggle to find that balance. Mm. Because when, yeah, you, uh, when you skew that balance too much, then it's like <clears throat> all the way that way. So uh, that's a bit of a mindfuck, just trying to, to... And on this journey, you learn more about how to balance yourself and that increases your self-awareness, which is quite cool. Yeah, yeah. I almost feel like it's actually almost impossible to really have balance or, or extremely difficult at least to have balance in your relationships, have balance in your um, business or entrepreneurship, have balance in your health, have balance in all these areas. Generally, if you're going to pursue one really hard, all the other areas or one of the other areas is going to suffer. There's only so much you can focus on on your plate. I notice that when I'm doing a video a day for YouTube, for example, I can't keep up with maybe my Instagram posts. I can't keep up with my blog posts. Or when I'm really studying for uni exams, it's hard for me to keep up with the YouTube videos. It's hard for me to keep up with my reading. So there's always like a shift, a movement, and it's really hard to find that sweet spot. Yeah, um, probably the one, is, one of the biggest forms of resistance I found with this book is that while you're writing it, while you're spending one year on this, while you're working the amount of hours where you could have made 40K at a job, and you're working mm. on this, and there's no like actual result that's coming out to you that's probably the one of most difficult one of the biggest reasons why it's difficult to remain focused on a book and why so few people actually write a book and so many people um uh want to it's, it's probably the same with what you're talking about with your course it would take you so many hours before you actually get results out of it and mm -hmm. and, and maybe because you're focusing on youtube and hustling so much on it making that decision just opposes that so much because straight away you would be in a in, in a space where you wouldn't be getting any um you wouldn't be getting any fruit from the tree. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So that's probably one of the most difficult things, and finding um, balance with that is difficult. <laughs> yeah. How, how do but you deal with doubt? Like for me personally, um, as much as I have this hustle mindset, I do have brief moments usually at least once a week where I just have massive doubt, where I just kind of think to myself, is this all worth it? Am I wasting my time here? Should I be, maybe I should be more responsible and do something else, you know, like uh, what's going on? Or when the results aren't really coming at the rate that you expect them to. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think there's um there's two ways to deal with that. and Because there's two instances. There's one where it's like a brief doubt like, oh, maybe I could chill right now. And in that instance, you just tell yourself, shut the fuck up. Like, come on. <laughs> shut the, shut the, shut the fuck, fuck up. The fuck you doing? Shut, shut the fuck up, little bitch. What do you like, know? What do you know? Yeah, yeah, what are you doing? What are you... <laughs> see a little slap like that. Yeah. Um, and the other instance, when you're having an existential crisis and you're like, oh, what's the point anyway? Yep. Um, <laughs> I think what's important is to remind yourself of the value you're giving to others. Oh, so that's when yeah. you take it out of yourself. That's when you become more selfless and you start to think, mm -hmm. okay, I'm working on my aptitudes. I'm working on my, my gifts, right? What I can add to the world. So um, if I don't do this, if, 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 I, if I like submit to this doubt, then I'm not only doing a disservice to myself, more importantly, a disservice to the world. So I think mm. in, in that instance, then you're like, okay, now I've got to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I find that um, recently I have not been meditating um, as consistently as I used to in the past. Right. basically because of the workload and just the habits kind of lost off, even though I'm always telling people to do it. But I found that the biggest difference is that now I have more of that resistance, more of those emotions popping up because I don't meditate. When I used to meditate, I used to just chill the fuck out, be all Eckhart Tolle. If things weren't working well, it would 
didn't bother me. Like if the channel wasn't growing, it didn't really bother me. I was just happy being alive. Whereas now because I've uh, reduced the amount of meditation I do, everything can start to get to me when shit hits the fan, when I'm not seeing results, when I put eight hours into a video and it gets like 200 views or something. That's when... <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually have a chapter on this and it's about Buddhism versus Stoicism. Oh. So Stoics will never um, like sit down and meditate like that. And I don't actually do that anymore. So okay. Stoic meditations are explicitly analytical, just thinking. Basically, the way I phrase it is firstly asking yourself, what are you doing? And then secondly, why are you doing it? So this is mindfulness, comparable to Vipassana or Samantha meditation in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the reason why people can't sustain that 10-minute meditation every single day, because if you think about it, 10 minutes a day for meditation is nothing for the benefits it has on your brain. Your prefrontal cortex, gray matter grows in volume there. You get more benefits for 10 minutes of that than 10 minutes of exercise. But people exercise. Why don't people meditate? And I think it's, it, it opposes our society. So there was an author called Oswald Spengler. And he wrote a book called The Decline of the West. And he calls our society a Faustian society. So it's a society that just wants to expand and grow and push, 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 push. All the while subconsciously knowing that there's no end result and satisfaction. So... He says that the end of culture is civilization, and we're in civilization right now. So my point is, I think, uh, Buddhist meditation, where you go into solitude, is like comparing a Zen master to a physicist. Um, mm. So how do I explain this? So, so the physicist is always pushing more and more and more and more, expanding, and the Buddhist person is contracting. Yeah. Stoic meditations do the same thing, being mindful, the Pasana meditation, but it doesn't do it to the point where it opposes our society so much. This is quite hard to explain. but um, Because going into solitude is, is a strange thing. You're attaching that mindfulness to just that state. So when I'm meditating, I'm mindful then. And then I get out of mindfulness as I stop the meditative session. But then I go back to, to the real world. So yeah. it creates such a like contradiction and two forces that are so opposing that it's difficult to maintain on a habitual basis. And that's why I think stoic meditations or mindfulness and just finding an activity like writing or playing an instrument or skateboarding where you can be mindful doing it is more like getting to the point of mindfulness in the real world and, and avoiding the negatives that solitude might have, if that even makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I, when I used to meditate a lot, I actually used to um, do a variation. So I would do the standard 10 minutes or 20 minutes sitting down. But throughout the day, as well as I was walking, I would like try feel my feet, be more mindful of what I was doing. Or when I'm in a conversation with someone, try be fully aware. I think that's actually better for you because you're using that mindfulness for practical things. That makes sense to just sitting down. Because all people, they'll sit down, they'll do the meditation, be super present then, as you said. But as soon as they get up, that contradiction will happen where – they start yelling at their mom or they start maybe and doing boom, something unconscious. Back into it. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So you're not, you're not like, <clears throat> like I said, you're getting to the point with it more. You're kind of allowing yourself to be mindful in more stressful and chaotic situations. So I think it would be more beneficial to go to like a fucking construction site and then just try not get agitated by the noise. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Cause that, yeah. that, I, I've had to deal with that so much because I'm writing this book right now and right next door for the last month they've been demolishing a building. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, fuck. And that's been a really good practice for me. So, yeah, I'm it, grateful about it. Even though it's really, really annoying, it's given me the opportunity to train that mindfulness. <laughs> it's it's um, kind of interesting too, yeah. um, observing how your brain works, observing how your body works. Like, let's say you're sitting there or you're meditating and you, you get an itch. You get an itch, all right? Yeah, and yeah. then you feel it. And then you just observe it and you want to touch it, but you try to be mindful. You're trying to be a Zen master, but for some fucking reason, it amplifies times a thousand. <laughs> yeah, it's strange. It's with really interesting itch, observing itches, that. Right out of nowhere. Yeah. I'll find myself sometimes I'm just like, okay, come on. <clears throat> <laughs> it's not working. So, so what I want to know is, is it the itch is actually that painful or is it just your mind that's making that painful? I really think it's just the perception of it. And it's strange exactly. when you think about it like that. Yeah, it's strange. Yeah. With, with, with everything, I mean, like events, 
that are like traumatic in your past and you're like holy shit that was awful at the time they don't mean shit right now so they were just a manifestation of your perception it wasn't actually a big deal <laughs> yeah yeah that's actually a very interesting thing that i'm i'm reading about now in this nlp book have you heard of neuro-linguistic programming nope that sounds fucking yeah no sounds, never. sounds pretty gnarly eh? but <laughs> it's basically like um a body of knowledge i'm not sure how um, scientifically valid it is. It could be some mumbo jumbo, but I've been reading about it. And they've got all these techniques to change how your mind works. So in the book I'm reading, it's actually interesting. It, it uh, asks you to try to observe your thoughts a bit more. So when you think about your memories and stuff, like when you recall memory, try and notice, do you recall in the first person or the third person? Or when you envision someone talking to you, what direction is the voice coming from? There's all these little things that happen in the way you think that you overlook so i think if you can gain a better understanding of how you think when some of these thoughts come these resistances that come when you're doing something you'll be uh better equipped to uh block them that makes no sense yeah it definitely makes sense it sounds interesting i think a lot of these books are all kind of about the same thing right just present yeah. <laughs> at the same time i guess you have to hammer it from different angles to to get the point across but that's 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 really true that's something i've noticed um, I, 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 I think no one is ever going to, I don't think anyone in the world is 100% mindful ever. Maybe like a Zen master gets close, but I don't think that's the point. The point is actually trying to do it. it it's the act mm. of actually being self-aware uh, self uh, to the point where you can actually recognize progress. I think when you're recognizing progress of your mindfulness, then you're on the right track. Also, you don't have to be a Zen master. Just a little bit of work into your mindfulness, you could literally be 10 times more mindful than what you were like last year. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it, there's heaps of benefits into it, into being mindful, meditating, and it really helps you with pushing through that resistance that we were talking about. I think a really great way to practice mindfulness, what we've been speaking about for the last minute, is to find one thing every day that you do at a similar time. So that's why... In stoic meditations, I'll always suggest you to do like your negative visualizations the moment, the, the minutes before you sleep, because every single day there are going to be minutes before you sleep. Mm. So you can completely rely on that as your source of your time to associate mindfulness with that. So whether you drink a cup of tea in the morning, find something that undoubtedly is something you're going to do every day. It could be a cold shower, for example. Hopefully you're showering every day. Um, if not, don't choose that. And that's why. Uh, <laughs> Choosing the moments before you sleep is such a reliable one and such an advocated one by the Stokes because you're going to do it every single day. So I think that's a good way to, um, to instill that mindfulness. Find something that you do every day. Do you, do you walk to a certain bus station every day? Do you drink a glass of water in the morning and be mindful while you do it? Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think Stoicism is making a comeback? Is it because of Web 2.0? Is it because of this huge... Uh, crazy singularity thing we got going on where everyone's sharing knowledge. So some of these jewels that were hidden in the past that maybe our parents or our grandparents weren't able to really um, find out about unless they read, you know, the dusty uh, meditations by Marcus Aurelius from the library is now... No, I, I don't think more. it is that because <clears throat> like a book like uh, William Irvine, A Guide to the Good Life, that came ages, came out ages ago, 10 years ago. Stoicism yeah. wasn't as popular then. The internet... Like wasn't as big, but it was still enough to the point where certain philosophies and certain trends can become viral. And, and, mm -hmm. and of course, today it's a bit different, but I think it's especially over the last few years is because we've become very, very comfortable, like to a ridiculous mm. amount. And we've become way too comfortable. So there's a need for it to come back. <laughs> you know you're fucked up as a society when things like Buddhism and Stoicism increase in popularity to teach people how to be natural. Like, mm. that's when you know your society is fucked up. And th that's something Oswald Spengler talks about in his book, The Decline of the West. Um, he says, yeah, that's when a, a, a culture turns to civilization where they need uh, teachers of the world to teach people how to be natural. <laughs> um, so that's why I think it's becoming popular because we're becoming increasingly more unnatural. Four years ago, people would actually speak about, oh, that person is looking on their phone while they're walking. But now it's like, okay, it's just a person walking on their phone, walking. Yeah. Uh, not walking on the phone, uh, looking at their phone while they're walking. So that's why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's actually a quote that I heard from um, Ty Lopez a while back. I'm not sure who wrote it knowledge. or who said it, but knowledge here in my garage. <laughs> 
but it's um it's i believe it's civilizations are born stoic by die epicurean so i feel like there's always a cycle going on where there's like a generation that works really hard and then the next generation enjoys the labors of the past generation the next generation has to work really hard again so there's a balance that needs to be achieved you can never have too many generations becoming epicurean too many generations becoming hedonistic becoming too comfortable otherwise civilizations actually die every there will be no people left it's really so, interesting I, I i thought about that the other day um and i was wondering if there was a philosophy that was about that cycle of cynicism, Epicureanism, um, Stoicism, and whether there was a philosophy that talked about that cycle of society being the natural way of being. Something interesting I was thinking about, but it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, yeah. Something I explore in the book as well, I have a chapter called The Civilian. So I speak about how in times of, um, uh, like the Romans, for example, they won, uh, uh, sorry, they, they won the war. They defeated Greece, whatever, and then they relaxed. And before that, they were all fit. They were all healthy because they had a war to fight. They had an urgency. But then they fell into comfort and and their society became um, hedonistic about material goods. And then the barbarians came down and destroyed them. <laughs> the barbarians. <laughs> yeah, from <laughs> yeah. Northern Europe. They came yeah. and they fucking chopped their heads off because they were mm-hmm. way too comfortable. They had lost... Uh, they'd become not fat, but they become materialistic. And that's what's happening to us right now. So that's why stoicism yeah. is so important, especially in the the context of health and obesity which i'm trying to cover so oh, it's, it's strange and and every time we win a war world war Two is our most recent example with the rise of technology and the enlightenment period it's it's that same comfort the romans experienced but it's just like exacerbated so much to the point where you've got people like kelly Drinkwater on ted speeches <laughs> saying fuck it fuck it okay it is, it's, it's Ooh, been my tenfold yeah yeah. So when's the next uh, fat acceptance coming out? I've actually been looking forward to that. Uh, I, there, there aren't many other clips. Like, I don't, I'm saying the same <laughs> shit each video. Like, I mean, if people want it, I'll make another one. I'm just waiting for the next <laughs> TED Talk. Eh, and then I could just, yeah. It, it's ridiculous, eh? Like, <clears throat> how it's come to that stage. It, yeah. I don't, even, I don't even know what to say about that, about the fat acceptance movie. Yeah. I, I should just make I a even... video just watching the video, having me in the corner, and they're just staring at it. Just like... <laughs> just to like show the ridiculousness of it. <laughs> do you think like... Do you think these people actually believe what they're talking about? Or it's just some elaborate lie they've made to feel better about themselves or so that other people yeah. don't judge them as much? No, I think it's that. Or I do think... they actually believe it? No, no, I don't think they actually believe it. I think they're very good at coming across... Like they actually believe. It. I think everybody has a, everyone's given a little spark of rationality at birth. Yeah. But for some people, it's very, very hidden. <laughs> for some people, yeah. it's bright, but for others, it's, it's deep in there somewhere, hidden under the um blubber. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think I think that like she has a little voice that's like, okay, obviously this is stupid, but I'm full of shit. <laughs> but her identity is so framed on that that escaping that and you know saying that she was wrong. Is just completely opposed to who her ego thinks she is. It's ego, yeah. ego, ego, yeah. ego ruins the well, maybe, world. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she's just real fucking dumb. But I yeah. think there's a certain yeah. point with the example of people like that where you have to step in and voice an opinion because <clears throat> there's a certain point where you can advocate these things and, and be in denial and just troll and stuff. But the moment you're advocating for something like obesity and you have and you're a good speaker like she was and you can actually influence and convince people, then you're gonna have kids that are just stuffing their faces. So. Yeah, yeah. You, you, especially when they have platforms like TEDx to be talking on, where they got the reach to reach like millions of people. And then there's other people that were beginning to believe that bullshit as well, and now seeing someone on TEDx say it, and yeah, they're gonna take it as reinforcement. Like, oh, okay, look, this person's saying this as well. Yeah, TEDx. Oh, TEDx is everything that comes out of TEDx is true, right? Everything you read in the book yeah. is real. Right? <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard for people to take things with a grain of salt I've realized like especially like people when they read books and stuff like that or watch podcasts say oh this person said Sam Harris said this Sam Harris said this so it must be right because Sam Harris has been right before you have to take things with a grain of salt you have to make your own decisions and yeah. get an array of different resources to choose from you can't just take everything Sam Harris or Joe Rogan says despite how influential despite how right how much um how cor- how good that track record was in the past, you still need to evaluate everything by yourself. 
I was I really had that issue when I was a teenager, and I think that's why um a lot of teenagers are very close minded like that, right? Because they haven't had they haven't been exposed to knowledge to abundance of knowledge to the point where they can kind of start to rationalize and connect the dots. And I think teenagers are very close minded like that because they find like a figure they can just look up to and take lessons from and absorb, and then they become fucking emos and shit, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think as you get no older, that's something I've really noticed is that I start to think a lot more critically and I start to disagree with people. And it's something I never mm. did before. Even when I was watching podcasts two years ago, I just kind of take it in and completely agree. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, good, good. <laughs> good, 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 good. But the more you listen, you're like, okay, that's not true because of this, because of this, because of this. And that's why I think it's so important to, to keep exposing yourself to knowledge so you can form your own rationalizations. Yes, yes. Yeah. Let's just try to tell my other friend the other day, the one I was trying to, oh, I haven't talked about it, but I was trying to convince this um, friend of mine to read up on um, a bunch of books to expand his mind. When you read books and when you uh, listen to podcasts, talk to different people, your mind literally changes. The way you think about things literally changes. Some things that you perhaps thought were acceptable prior start becoming unacceptable. Some of the values you held before start becoming ridiculous. Some of the beliefs you had start disintegrating in front of your eyes. Yeah. So it's really important that you get as much information as you can so that you can become who you are meant to be, if that makes sense. Because a lot of the things that we do are not really 100% based on what we want to do. It's based on our upbringing, based on our society, our friends around us. But if you... Um, see all this knowledge you have a better chance of choosing what you truly want definitely couldn't agree more with that yeah and i i also think or something i i disagree with for example so joe rogan he really criticizes like personal development and self-help literature and says oh it's it, it's it's a bunch of like oh what what have they done to be able to uh, oh to yeah make books like that and i'm i'm like okay um I think a lot of the time with these things isn't about the material itself. And like we were saying before, presentness, like people objectively know that that's good. So why are there so many different books on it? And I don't think that's the point. I think it's the state of mind people are in when they're reading the books. Mm. So it's going back to what we were also saying about uh, being in that hustle mindset when you're not actually being productive. So it's, it, people objectively know what the right thing to do is. They can read a book on productivity. They know to be more productive than it just have to do the work but being in that mindset helps them escape from that hedonistic pleasure-seeking mindset that they're always in so just reading the book for that period of the day or clicking on that rsd video for example and listening to it already understanding and knowing what the fuck the guy is trying to insinuate but it helps you switch back into that mode of like hustle improvement 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 mm, yes definitely have you been a, have you um What's your reading like? Have you found that as you've gone along this journey, you start you started um, reading more material or reading less? Personally, for me, I actually used to read a lot more when I started. The reason being is that as I've gone through, I've noticed that a lot of books that I've been reading uh, tend to be repetitive, or I feel like there's a certain time when you need to uh, start doing more action and seeing what works for you in the real world as opposed to just uh, theorizing and reading about it. Like especially like this YouTube thing. So reading about perhaps, you know, making a blog or entrepreneurship, reading the four hour work week, it gets to the time where you have to do it. So you still pick up the books that are gonna give you the knowledge you need, but instead of like reading it religiously, you might just skim through it to the section that you need, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think there was a quote and it was by someone who says there's a certain point in a man's life where he has to stop reading and start writing. And that was something yeah. but I don't think that that's in like an absolute like five years of reading and then writing. I think it comes in stages and in cycles. And like a month ago, I stopped reading books completely because I have a deadline for the editor for the book. And if I read anything else right now, it's just going to give me more ideas and I'm just going to start drafting more and it's never going yeah. to end. So yeah. 100% couldn't agree more. I'll listen to podcasts, but I'll try to keep it unrelated unless I know 100% that there's like a hole in a paragraph or a chapter that needs to be made better. <laughs> otherwise you get a uh, scope creep you what? finish the scope book a <laughs> scope creep is like when your scope fucks up it's, it's a project management term oh, right. i'm sorry okay. my fucking engineering degrees no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, i studied like plants and shit at uni <laughs> <laughs> you, you said to the editor 
He sent me an email. Please, send it back. I need to change the whole book. <laughs> uh, I don't want to write my sources no more. <laughs> I changed my mind. Scopes. <laughs> Scope creep. <laughs> Make sure you like the video, guys. It will really encourage us for, uh, you know, getting up and talking all this shit for the past hour. <laughs> so yeah. we can talk more shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. lots of shit. Um, tell us what topics you want us to cover. Anything, we'll cover it. Uh, we're down to cover what you guys are interested in hearing about. So let us know. Interact in the comment section down below and check out the Realized Man's channel. Links in the description. Peace. Thanks for having me, bro. Until next time. Ladies.